everyone. Um, I'm Shana, and uh, I'm talking about aesthetic autonomy in creative, feminist creative publications. Um, so first I'd like to extend many thanks to my advisors, Dr. Amy Bott of Gender Women's Studies, Dr. Nicole Pekarski of English, um, Carrie Souter of Interdisciplinary Studies, and also to Jenna McGlynn of the Office of Undergraduate Education, who I'm really happy showed up, um, and Dean Diane Lee and uh, Provost Philip Ross, who uh, funded my capstone with an undergraduate research award. Uh, so how many people have heard of Mary Shelley? Or Frankenstein, which she wrote. Great, so a lot of people. Um, I read Frankenstein in high school and um, was struck by the fact that Mary Shelley, uh, she wrote Frankenstein as a 19 year old. Um, it was published in 1818 uh, when she was 21 years old, which for many people in the room is impressive and for me is a huge accomplishment because I'm 22 and I haven't published a book yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I would say that she's arguably more famous than her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, um, who is a very fantastic poet. But Mary Shelley basically invented science fiction. Um, and she incorporated themes of uh, female passivity and prejudice in her works, um, especially Frankenstein, which uh, was an amazing commentary for the time, for the 19th century. Um, uh, in the Victorian period. So, Mary Shelley was uh, one of the first women to navigate the world of literature as a woman. She, pub she published anonymously, but later uh, published as in under her own name. And she is one of the most famous authors of all time now. Um, my research asks, how can we today write creatively in a socially conscious and feminist way? Um, now, this is a big question, but uh, I wanted to create a project that would explore how identity is represented creatively, and to have a positive and authentic effect on the reader, to be artistically profound, um, and to really combine like activist goals with creative goals in a really new way. And. Now, why is this an interdisciplinary approach? Like, why is this needed? Um, creative writing isn't an activist discipline, inherently. Although, George Orwell would not agree with you. Um, feminism and creative writing are both applied heavily, but writing and media are powerful tools um, where language and visual and social come together. All these aspects combine. Um, and we need an interdisciplinary approach because there is no other way to handle this topic with only one discipline. Um, gender and women studies is not, create, is not a creative field, um, and creative writing is not a feminist field. Um, when you combine the two, you get something really special. So these are my disciplines. Um, I used English, specifically creative writing, uh, gender and women studies, media and communication studies, and visual arts, and uh, specifically graphic design. This is my concept map. Uh, so you can see the interconnections are extremely um, prolific here. There's lots of lines, um, and each is important. <laughs> so this is the disciplinary soup. Um, and so the analytical component of my project uh, followed Repco's 10 steps of integration. Um, I used a literature review, extensive, uh, which covered both creative writers themselves and their work, um, and also literary theory. And I used feminist methodology, specifically uh, the idea that one has to identify their own biases um, in their research to interrogate their own assumptions and to define their terms very explicitly. Now, I also did a creative project um, because I'm a writer myself. And this follows the creative process from start to finish, um, from content creation to editing and refinement of the content to design of a booklet itself, and then finally distribution. So I created um, an informal literary magazine 
which uh, explores the topics that I've talked about in my essay um, and hopefully demonstrates them in a practical application. These are some disciplinary insights that I've drawn from. And it was really important to me to include artists themselves, to talk about writing in a, the way that writers talk about writing. So I've analyzed, um, and you can see some key authors up here, Italo Calvino, uh, Eudora Welty, Juno Diaz, and Adrian Rich, and some critical theories as well. And visual arts might seem sort of out of place among all these features, but it was extremely important to me to understand how the visual intersected with the academic. Um, so thinking about the ideas of like visual architecture, what a page looks like, and how that affects the way that you read um, a poem or a story. The integrative strategies that I used, um, I wanted to create common ground through extension. So I used the theory um, of bodies as ambiguous places where the mind and the physical come together um, and are not separate. There's this ambiguity where your brain and your body seem separate at first, but when you think about it, they're inex inextricable. Um, so I wanted to extend this theory to writing itself, where the way that the writing appears on the page and the way that someone reads it affects the way that they think about that piece. And there's room for ambiguity there as well. Now, um, I also use the idea of advancing through checks and balances. And in this way, I wanted to think of writing as a garden. So a garden can be chaotic. If you throw your seeds everywhere, um, pour some water, let it rain. And <laughs> chaos can be beautiful. But when you think of writing as a garden, um, each garden is different. Each story is different. Each poem is different. And each gardener is different. Each writer brings their self to the writing. But Sometimes you need to prune a garden. Uh, you need to prune a rose so that it can grow to be beautiful, or to be uh, to smell nice, or to occupy space in a certain way. And so, in this way, feminism is the pruning of the garden of writing. Um, now, feminism is a way to keep writing intellectually honest. So, just like our government has checks and balances to make sure no one's getting out of line. Um, so do the disciplines sort of check each other. So my results, what did I find? Uh, writing is a political act. So I talked about Orwell earlier. Um, Orwell wrote in uh, an essay called Why I Write uh, that writers have a desire to push the world in a certain direction, that writing is political. And uh, this can't be ignored when you look at the social impact of writing, um, especially creatively. Uh, especially today when writing is the core of media. So every television show is first a script. Every movie is first a script. Um, and when you look at these things through a critical lens, you can not only view society more critically, but your own self and your own message. The, the way that you push the world in a certain direction uh, should be criticized. So this hinges upon the idea that the visual is reality um, in contemporary society. So the visual is the actual. And that means that when you write about the visual, um, then you're writing about reality. So attention to lyrical detail, um, especially setting and metaphor, are important even in prose. And um, when a writer uses the visual in a certain way, then you're, you're, you're affecting the audience in a way that expresses reality in a new way. So this also hinges upon the idea of identity. 
And I drew upon the theory of feminist autography, which is different from autobiography. It's writing about the self, but writing about the self not from a factual standpoint, but in a way that expresses identity and feeling how you feel about yourself. And uh, from that, you also have feedback. So in the contemporary world, uh, feedback is important, and listening to what people think about your work and integrating that into your future work is necessary um, to affect these goals. So I'd like to end with a quote um, by Juno Diaz, who is one of uh, the authors that I examined. And he says, the most toxic formulas in our cultures are not passed down in political pra practice, but passed down in mundane narratives. It's our fiction where the toxic virus of sexism, racism, homophobia, where it passes from one generation to the next, and the average artist will kill you before they remove these poisons. And if you want to be a good artist, it means writing really about the world. And when you write cliches, whether they are sexist, racist, homophobic, classist, that is a cliche. Art discomforts. The transgressiveness of art has to deal with confronting people with the real. And sexism is a way to avoid the real, avoiding the reality of women. Homophobia is to avoid the real, the reality of queerness. And these things are the way we hide from encountering the real. But art, art is just about that. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the interdisciplinarity out there. You know, you talk about the checks and balances, and that made sense to me, sort of feminism acting as a check, or keeping creative writing intellectually honest. I like your pruning analogy. Your analogy. So you use this beautiful garden analogy, and was that your own analogy? Is that something that came up in literature? Because why wouldn't you consider your own approach as reasoning through analogies as another interdisciplinary approach? Yeah, no, I, d I did come up with that, um, just sort of brainstorming metaphors. So mm -hmm. my job as a poet is to during <laughs> brainstorm metaphors all the time. Mm -hmm. So that came easily to me. Um, and I just sort of thought of like what, what made sense, mm -hmm. um, and that made sense to me. Okay. So I would encourage you to think of multiple ways in which this is interdisciplinary. And, and I really liked your use of, of metaphor or analogy to, to orient that in our minds. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, that's sort of a direct metaphor from with only including two of my disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, but the other disciplines are important also uh, in that metaphor because if you think about visual art, like uh, we experience the world in a really visual way. Our brains are extremely visual, um, like as a species. And so when you think about like visual arts and how like uh, visual artists or visual theorists have thought about the way that we view art is really important also in thinking about the way that we view writing as an art. Mm -hmm. Could I just do a follow-up with, um, I, I hope you'll, if we have enough time, you'll share an excerpt. You, you talked about the creative writing piece, and I don't know if you actually shared any of your own creative writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if we have time, I know there are other questions. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I really congratulate you on use of so many different interdisciplinary uh, strategies. And uh, my question is about Repco. You said you used the 10 Repco steps. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that? Would you do it again voluntarily? <laughs> yeah. Um, I find that Repco is a really, really useful framework um, for me personally in doing this sort of integrative analysis because it, it lays out the 10 steps of like, uh, you know, defining your problem, which is a great way of putting that. Instead of just like, this is my thesis, this is the problem, and this is the questions that I'm going to ask, um, and this is the result that I have. So I, I've used Repco in the past in um, my NDS classes, and I chose to use it again um, for my accompanying paper, just because I think that it's, um, it's a creative, flexible means of sort of looking at information and exploring a topic. That answers your question. So if I could follow up with that, um, any thoughts on that? Is, is there a paradox here? You're using Red Cold almost as like an objective recipe, when your whole claim is that there's no objectivity to be found. Did right. that cause you any reflection? 
Yeah, I mean, I felt that using Repco, I, like I said, I feel like it's a really flexible format. So I didn't necessarily have to be like, all right, I'm going to use these steps and these steps and these steps. I combined some things. I excised some, some steps um, that I didn't feel were useful to me. And it's working from this really academic standpoint, whereas the work that I do is primarily creative. Um, and so like sort of trying to combine those two ways of thinking was really important for me. And uh, it's, you know, it's really difficult to navigate that space. I think I asked answers and unasked question there, which was when you say framework, I um, say recipe, you've just convinced me that it really was a framework because you said you literally excised elements without it crafting, mm -hmm. you were able to reshape it to your own purpose. Yeah, I would. And Repco always says this is not necessarily a strictly linear process, Yeah, that you can make it organic. I mean, I think that's the best part of interdisciplinary studies is that it's what you make it. And so if you want to use Repco, you can. If you want to use parts of Repco, you can. But it's not necessarily required or necessary if you don't want to use that. Yeah. I did have one more, but I don't want to speak. Well, since we have a, a little bit of time left, can we share a poem with us? Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. So, um, So um, my poetry is extremely personal. So if this gets a little weird, like nobody, no, don't don't worry about it. I'm not uncomfortable. Um, I, do, <laughs> I do this all the time. Um, having strangers know sort of weird, intimate details about my my psyche. Uh, okay. Um, this poem is called Day Trip. Day Trip. We are on an adventure. Humming cold holds this stranger city, the temperature so low it's silent, the concrete covered with thin salt. Today might repose, pausing for you and I, leaving us to feel our way around. We discover little, the shops closed. We left too late in the day. In the car we pass the hospital your dad died in. Your palms unfold like pale pink flowers. It's no wonder you know the drive so well. Our skin is iridescent from the cold. We stop in the Macy's for warmth and wait to hear an old man play the largest organ in the world. The song he chooses is too unruly for our mood. We lurk between ruffled pink skirts in the girls' section balcony attending. You tell me you're afraid of heights. On the ride back, we agree that there is no one else in the world. We like to talking. We like talking to better than the other. It's hard to talk after that. We play music, climbing towards home. I am grateful for all you have told me. There is no one stopping to listen, sometimes. 